Good day, mate, and welcome to Operation Sonic Spark in Brisbane, Australia. Today, the aliens, proper ratbags they are, are stealing all the pizza in Brisbane, and the Aussies want me to do two things. One, lob on in and put an end to the little anchorbiters pizza thieving ways, and two, for me to stop trying foreign accents, because this Seppo's accent is a bloody insult to the lucky country. So I'm going to stop using the accent now, because I like and respect Australia. And if Hollywood has taught me anything, it's that Aussies are tough, play rugby, and will beat me up with some combination of oversized knives, boomerangs, and a can of Fosters or something. I'm sure those assumptions are accurate and in no way offensive. So we start the mission off with a pro tip. Meld is one of the few environment elements that move. That means you can see it through the fog of war. So if you always start off a mission, sort of scanning around, you might be able to find a direction to head off and find some meld. Sure enough, we see we got some in the top left of the map, and we're going to orient that way. I have two plans in this mission. One is to show off the skills of a squad sight sniper. So Jimmy's gonna get to shine, hopefully. The second goal is to showcase my new microphone. This thing looks really official, and I no longer have to hear all the I get whenever I have a microphone that's right next to my mouth. I'm pretty sure there's a technical term for all those sound that happen in your voice, but uh, yeah, that required research and knowing someone who's an actual speech therapist, and I don't think we know anyone like that. So as I stated before, we want to show off Jimmy's new squad sight skills. So we put her at the back of this truck, meaning she should have a pretty good line of sight to most of what I think will be the battlefield. Everyone else just runs along the other side of the truck, and we end up getting the meld. Nice. Seeing as we're near the middle of the map and we haven't activated a single group of enemies, I'm pretty sure once I move DJ Sucre here, that we're going to have to fight a group of aliens. Only, it turns out I'm wrong, and we're gonna have to fight two groups of sectoids. But at least we're gonna get an opportunity to see Jimmy try and make one of her new long range trick shots. Between the rods of this fence and through three different windows, the odds probably aren't very good, but Jimmy is, well, no, okay, yeah, the odds just weren't that good. Probably wasn't the best shot to take. So DJ Sucre doesn't really have a good shot to either alien. So we opt for defense, hunker him down, then put Beto Burr and Citrus Architect into Overwatch, hoping the aliens overextend and get blown away by the Overwatches. But cheating dastards the aliens are, They move right up to where they can see Beto Burr, but not trigger his overwatch shot. That bullcrap then gets followed up by critting all over Beto Burr's face. After that, the aliens in the store move up, and with the plasma in his eyes, Beto Burr doesn't seem to notice that there's a car between him and his target. So right now, Beto Burr and DJ Sucre are surrounded by four aliens. We need to get that number down, and Jimmy has a shot befitting a Michael Jordan Larry Bird McDonald's commercial. Through the fence, over the table, around the newspaper stand, nothing but net. Beetlebird tries to take care of the alien on the other side of this, but looks like he has the case of the minimums. So crap, we're still surrounded. But that means this is a perfect time to introduce you all to Splice Strategies Axiom number 12. If you're saying, oh crap, it's probably a good time for a rocket. And DJ Sucre is more than happy to demonstrate. With his flanking buddies now a smoldering pile of ashes, this alien decides that this party's lame and is gonna blow this popsicle stand. But DJ Sucre, not wanting it to feel left out, decides to move up so that he and Jimmy can be this guy's new flanking buddies. And Jimmy has an 88% chance to be his flanking buddy, so this should be... disappointing. Well, at least DJ Sucre has a 67% chance to- Oh, for booting up cold! What were the odds of them missing both of those shots? Spectacular. Despite having a whopping 96.04% chance to hit this turn, the only hit we get is the hit of Hypo Spray Beetle Burr takes to heal up. We do get a tad lucky though, as the alien, instead of pressing his advantage as there's no overwatches, decides to hide in the shadows. I move Beetle Burr up to get a visual on the alien that's hiding, and instead we find these two aliens just sitting here in the corner paper macheing up a body. They were just shiftlessly doing nothing there this entire fight. 
Rocket goes off outside your building, do nothing. Buddies to your right getting shot up, do nothing. Pal retreats through your area screaming about humans killing everyone, do nothing. Ally getting shot at by a sniper, do nothing. Window right next to you shatters from a hail of bullets, do nothing. I prefer to think that these guys were the stoner aliens that no one wanted to bring on the mission. And wouldn't you know it, the two potheads take cover behind the display with all the munchies. But while XCOM has a very strict just say no policy to drugs, we don't really care what the aliens decide to do. That's their business. And just to show them how accepting we are, DJ Sucre is going to help these two get blazed. With a grenade. Now that the explosions are coming from inside, the two aliens that were in the pizzeria's kitchen decide to see what's going on. Beetlebur tries to get in on the action, but life's rough when you're plagued with the minimums. Meanwhile, Jimmy still thinks she's in a McDonald's commercial. Between the fence posts, over the table, trim the hedge, kiss off the rubble, nothing but net. Next, the random number generator's favorite sectoid decides to get in on the action. Unfortunately for it, its luck seems to have run out as it misses DJ Sucre. So, DJ Sucre moves up and takes his shot. This little alien has dodged shots of 88%, 67%, and 64%. The one shot that hit was minimum damage. If enemy within is the Matrix, then this sectoid is Neo. When your heavy is about to get flanked and baked by two aliens, your assault is out of position to help, and your sniper is out of ammo, it's easy to panic. It's important in these situations to remember the shortest and sweetest of the splice strategy's axioms. Axiom number 16, stay whelmed. A quick assessment of the situation will show that this alien only has one hit point, meaning we don't need to do a lot of damage, we just need a hit. Citrus Architect is too far away, and Jimmy's out of ammo. That means it's all on Beetober. We just need to get him the highest percentage shot we can find him and let him take it. 48% chance. Not good. For this situation, there is only one applicable axiom. Axiom number 18. Sometimes you just have to say a prayer to the random number generator and take a bad shot. Boom, Takalaka! I've said it once and I'll say it again. When you need clutch shooting, you can't beat Beatover. That only leaves one alien on the field and he's in Overwatch. Luckily for us, DJ Sucre has the perfect advance to get the flank shot. So ends Operation Sonic Spark. We captured both melds. Jimmy showed off her new squad sight skills. Beatover helped us avoid disaster. DJ Sucre got a very impressive 5 out of 8 kills, and the Brisbane Pizzeria is safe from scumbag sectoids. As we land, the game informs us that we can now build an officer training school, meaning someone has been upgraded to sergeant. And that someone is 06 Jimmy, who also earned the nickname Lady Grey. Gunslinger gives us an additional 2 damage with pistols, making it so the sniper doesn't have to stay still in order to be effective. On the other hand, Good Ground gives us an additional 10 to aim and defense whenever the enemy is lower than the sniper. I tend to run with two snipers in any large party I get, so I try not to fret too much about this decision. But with my first sniper, I always go with Gunslinger. And the reason for it is simple. In the smaller parties, I definitely need the versatility that Gunslinger gives me. The other promotion belongs to 01DJ Sucre. The first option for our new corporal is Bullet Swarm. Bullet Swarm is a pretty nifty ability, which makes it so that shooting with the heavy's first action does not end his turn. That means the heavy can shoot and shoot, shoot and overwatch, shoot and reload, or shoot and move. The other option is also equally nice. Hollow targeting makes it so that anything that the heavy shoots at gives an additional 10 bonus for any allies that shoot at it afterwards. This move really comes into its own in the late game when you start facing enemies that have a lot of health and thus you need more than one person on the team to kill it. But right now I'm not worried about the late game. What I'm worried about is the early game and thus I'm going to take the versatility that Bullet Swarm gives us. After that we mourn the fact that Beetlebur will spend 5 days in the med bay. And hey, we get an international cross medal, which we'll soon be renaming. After that, we check on over in the situation room and see that about half the world is not pleased with my performance. 
Next, in Construction Corner, we have the cash for it, and now we are going to buy the Officer Training Center. The most important ability the Officer Training Center gives you once it's complete is that it lets you buy increased squad size. And let's face it, having another soldier in a lot of these situations would be more than a little helpful. So I go to the scanner, scan for a little bit, and my excavation's complete. With those done, I go back to start construction on the workshop that I'd swore I'd build after refusing an engineer mission in favor for a cash mission at the end of episode 7. Only, the workshop cost 130 double S's, and I only have 100 double S's. Oops. To rectify the problem, I head to the gray market to sell a few sectoid corpses to pre-med students who are uncomfortable with cutting up human cadavers, but still need to practice on something vaguely humanoid. Then I start constructing the workshop. Engineers, here we come. So we scan again. Evil Emison returns to active duty, and our experimental warfare research completes. With that research, we can now build Reaper rounds for increased bullet damage but less accuracy. The foundry, where we can start advanced projects that makes us even more awesome than we already are, the Phoenix Cannon, which makes our interceptors more dangerous, and flashbang grenades, which will disorient our enemies, making them easier to capture. The next decision is what to research next. For me, the option is either to do a long game gambit for beam weapons, or go to the xenobiology route and try to capture stuff. The problem is, xenobiology, in order to maximize its usefulness, you need to then build an alien prison cell to house the aliens. By the time it's done, the beam weapons would nearly be complete. So I'm opting for beam weapons, which are more powerful, and hoping that in the long term, the ability to kill better will allow me to capture better. After that, I go to the barracks, renamed the International Service Cross the Crimson Typhoon Cross because I'm still obsessed with Pacific Rim and got it for Christmas. Thanks, family, and give it the ability to grant two aim per continent bonus. Then, I award the Crimson Typhoon Cross to 06 Jimmy, making her a better sniper. After that, I award the Spare Cherno Alpha badge I have laying around to 01 DJ Sucre. So, I go back to scanning. Beetober returns to active duty, and the cybernetics bay roars to life. And now, I'm itching to turn someone into a cyborg. The only question is, who? Each class gets a bonus to be in a mech, but the one I want to try out is the support's ability to create a field around them that makes their allies have more defense if they're behind cover. Very useful. So that means the only options are 03 Beetober or 09 Gemini Spark. But Beetober has been a great soldier, and we haven't tested this process out on anyone yet. And it's sort of bad policy to experiment on good soldiers. So then I walk up to Gemini Spark and say to him, I say, Hey, do you want to help the team? And Gemini, he just rolls his eyes and goes, No, I want you to cut off all my arms and legs with a chainsaw. So I did. Then he gets all indignant on me. He's like, Hey man, I was just being sarcastic. Well, that's just great. How was I supposed to know that? I'm not a psionic for crying out loud. Besides, now he's got a really cute nickname, Torso Boy. So what's he complaining about? Say, that reminds me of another amusing anecdote. I didn't actually show all that in order. It takes a few days for the augmentation process, and I had to sell two more sectoid corpses to afford it. In the meantime, the officer training school completed, I sold a flight computer and a sectoid corpse and a thin man corpse to afford squad size one. So now I can have five soldiers. Awesome. Then I needed to buy the mech suit for Gemini Spark so he can actually go into combat. So I sell even more junk, get 25 double S's, and build the suit. I have the option of giving him the flamethrower or the kinetic strike module. The kinetic strike module deals punishing damage, 12 HP per punch, but unfortunately I can only punch one target at a time. The flamethrower on the other hand fires a cone of flames that deals 6 damage and can be used twice per mission. Ultimately, the flamethrower is better for surviving early game, so that's my choice. After that, I need to play dress up with the new and improved Gemini Spark. I feel weird not putting a helmet on my giant robot man, so even though it gives up the headband, I'm going to give him a helmet that looks the most electric rat-like and head back in for more scanning. And soon enough, the month ends and it's time for the Legion of Doom's report. We are extremely impressed with the progress of the XCOM project thus far, Commander. As well you should be, Mr. Luthor. I ended up not getting a single soldier killed this month. That's good work. 
Now, so give me the extra cash and the engineer so that I can get back to real work. Unfortunately, because I forgot to build the other satellite, after expenses, I only have 65 double S's. So it's actually back to scanning. And hey, the workshop completes. And because of that, I remember that I never actually built a Phoenix cannon for my interceptors. So I build one, equip it, and we're gonna be safe from medium UFOs now. Well, the aliens must have gotten the memo that I can now shoot them out of the sky better, cause now they're being bold and just directly landing their craft in Nigeria. Well, we aren't putting up with that. So we're gonna send in the team. Now, I have a couple of options. First thing, I'm not going to build a super fighting robot and not take him. So Gemini Spark is coming. Next, I have no backup heavies, snipers, or, thanks to Gemini Spark's ascension to cyborg, supports. What I do have is a giant robot who can fill in as a heavy for one mission. So we're letting DJ Sucre take a rest and bringing up 07 Pharaoh's Queen to try and get us some depth. With that, we're off to Nigeria to issue the aliens a very hardcore parking Strike ticket. Okay, whichever intern we're letting name the missions, we need to fire him. Using Spark twice in a row? Mm -mm. Not cool, not trending. That's not going to get us any buzz on Twitter. We need to hire someone with more creativity, more pizzazz, maybe a humanities major or something. Regardless, join us next week for Operation Twisted Spark. Until then, I'm Splice, and remember that chicks dig giant robots.